Hey everyone, I'm Clay Pigeon, and today I'm in Hobart for the Shannon's All German Car Show Day. The local clubs have been invited to show off their cars on Parliament lawns. Salamanca Market is raging in the background, but I'm not here for that. I'm here for the angry German horsepower. There are far fewer entrants here than I would have expected, but the quality is high, so stay with me for some awesome cars. I'll be taking the time out to do a closer look at the more intriguing models of the show, and I will include pricing. So if you've ever wanted to show a particular car, this might just help you out. And let me know in the comments what you would like to have in your garage. Whilst there were fewer entrants than I might have liked, one thing became crystal clear. BMWs were ruling the roost. The BMW Car Club had come out in force, it seems, and they were here to represent Bavarian Motor Works. There were many modern models, and there were many classics, and BMWs were in abundance, more so than any other brand. We're talking a wide range of models and years. There was the Z Series and M cars, and also one of the most expensive 7 Series ever made in the form of the 760 Li. There was almost a timeline that showcased the evolution of the iconic brand right here on the Parliament lawns, and it it wasn't just about quantity, there was also quality. The care these owners had put into the vehicles was nothing short of outstanding. I would normally expect there to be at least one or two older three series or maybe five series with a bit of rust and perhaps needing some work, but not today. The prevalence of BMWs here isn't just about brand popularity though, it speaks volumes about the loyalty of BMW enthusiasts. There's a sense of community here, and a shared passion brings these owners together. Having owned a few BMWs myself over the years, I can say that the BMW Car Club is tight-knit and quite knowledgeable. One model stood out for me. This, a 1983 BMW 323i. The car represents an accessible gateway into the realm of classic BMWs. For those dreaming of owning a piece of automotive history without breaking the bank, this is kind of a gem. They're priced at around 16,000 Australian, and it remains well within reach for many car enthusiasts who are looking to start their journey into classic car ownership. It's a testament to the idea, entering the world of vintage vehicles doesn't always require a six-figure sum. But if you do want to spend a six-figure sum on a classic BMW, this is one of the most desirable of all time. The 1988 BMW M3. This car isn't just a vehicle, it's a legend, it's an icon of performance and design. When the M3 first hit the streets in the late 80s, it was more than a car, it was a statement. It was born from BMW's racing pedigree. It was a road legal race car that anyone, anyone who had the money at least, could own. The 1988 model had a distinctive boxy shape and an aggressive stance. It immediately turned heads and set hearts racing. And the allure isn't just skin deep. The M3, from the very beginning, was engineered for perfection, with a focus on delivering a driving experience like no other. Under the hood lies the infamous BMW S14 Straight 4. In its base form, it produced 147 kilowatts or so, 197 brake horsepower. It that varied a little bit, uh, went up as high as 212 brake horsepower in certain limited editions. In conjunction with this powerful engine that was well ahead of its time, it was matched with a chassis that handled like a dream. Driving M3 from this era is about feeling connected to the road and every turn, and acceleration is just a symphony of sound. And then there's the rarity factor. Whilst they might have once been relatively common, the 1988 M3 has become a collector's dream. It's not just a car you drive, it's an investment. Owning one is about being part of an exclusive club, and it's a piece of BMW's illustrious racing heritage. If you want to get into one, you're going to need to have at least $150,000. And that's a testament to its enduring appeal and the ever-growing interest in classic performance cars. And I desire one more than words. This BMW 2002 TII instantly catches the eye with its lime green hue. A striking choice that definitely sets it apart from the crowd, it's safe to say that this is a very love it or hate it colour. The BMW 2002 series is known for its significant role in cementing BMW's reputation for sporty, compact cars. 
This 2002 TRI convertible is firmly in the realm of automotive history. It's a tangible reminder of an era where BMW truly began to define itself as a maker of driver-focused vehicles. You know, when I talk about BMWs, or when people talk about BMWs in general, there's this immediate recognition of quality and performance that just comes to mind. And I think that's quite a feat, given the vast majority of cars they produce are actually pretty pedestrian in nature and slow quite frequently. They also have serious long-term reliability problems and expensive servicing costs. So it's incredible how this brand has consistently managed to maintain this image for essentially my entire lifetime. A lot of that is to do with the top end and more desirable models that BMW produces and that they sprinkled these models throughout their range. One thing that always does stand out to me though is that BMW does have a commitment to the driving experience. On the note of driving experience, this BMW 850i was a really, really big deal when it was new, and I think it's a really, really big deal now. This was considered a grand tourer, and it was a masterpiece of the early 90s. It's part of an era where BMW dared to blend luxury and power in a way that few others could. The 850i was sleek. It had a futuristic design, a V12 engine, and it was a statement piece by BMW. It was designed to showcase their engineering prowess and vision for the future. What sets the 850i apart is that unique combination of comfort and performance. It's not just a fast car, it's a fast car that you can comfortably drive for hours. I've driven a couple, and it isn't frantic performance, it's not like a V8 or a turbocharged 6. Instead, you just get shoved further and further into your seat, and the speed increases relentlessly. The truly wild thing is that there was a period of time where you could get one for about $10,000. Now though, you better have at least $50,000 available for one that's worth owning. Next we have something that I can't accurately value. This is a stunning Volkswagen Combi single cab view. It's a prime example of a classic model that's been perfectly modified. It's been turbocharged, giving it a heart that beats with more power and zest than you'd ever expect from a combi. And the engine work on this is a true labour of love, a blend of classic design and it must have absolutely modern performance. There's meticulous attention to detail here, the care and effort put into this restoration become even more evident. The paintwork is impeccable, and reviving its classic charm is what I would consider a period correct paint job. Then there's the hardwood tray, which is gorgeous and adds both functionality and an aesthetic appeal. That said, I don't know if I personally would ever want to put anything on that tray in case I damaged it. There's a thoughtful customization here that's turned a classic car into personal statement. It's a reflection of the owner's taste and passion, but it maintains its period appeal. Next up we have the Porsches, and there were only five on display. Granted they were spanning a significant length of time. With four- wait, hang on, why did I walk past this? That's a 1988 Porsche 911 Carrera. I've been looking for one of those for a while now and I've stumbled across it here, I didn't even realise in the moment. I guess you always miss something, right? So why have I been looking for one of these? Well, the 1988 Porsche 911 holds a significant place in automotive history due to several key factors. Firstly, it represents the evolution of the Porsche 911 series, which has been a cornerstone of the brand since its introduction in the 1960s. This model year continued the tradition of Porsche's commitment to engineering excellence and driving performance. Secondly, the 1988 Carrera featured notable improvements over its predecessors. It had a more powerful and reliable 3.2 litre flat six engine, and it delivered excellent performance while maintaining the classic 911 driving characteristics. The engine, known for its durability, solidified the 911's reputation for longevity and reliability. Additionally, this model incorporated refined handling dynamics. The G-Series, to which the 1988 Carrera belongs, was known for significant improvements in handling and stability, partly due to the introduction of the 915 transmission and later the G50 gearbox. These changes made the car more drivable and accessible to a wider range of enthusiasts. And fourthly, 
more important than all of that. In fact, I think the most significant thing of all. This is the Porsche from the year I was born. What? Of course I want one. Bad reasons to want a Porsche aside, there's a sense of timelessness in their designs, or some might say a lack of aesthetic design changes. I think it depends on your perspective and your ethos when it comes to engineering. If you want slow, steady progress towards mechanical perfection, then Porsche might just be the company for you. That said, the average price of the Porsche sitting here today is well over $80,000, so you had better have a fat check. Next up, we had a few Mercs in show. I really like Mercedes, and it also featured the most expensive car by quite a long way. The mid-60s Mercedes 230 SL is a classic sports car that is incredibly desirable. I don't know necessarily if its price tag is representative of its quality, but it sure was a pretty thing. And why do I like Mercs? Well, I think Top Gear has a lot to answer for that. Growing up, all I knew Mercedes for was that they were expensive and quiet on the road. Then the various AMG series of the different Mercedes classes started showing up on TV and a peal of V8 thunder and tire smoke. So now, I keep an eye on the prices of C63 AMGs, waiting for the day that they reach the bottom of their depreciation curve. And I tell you, the day is coming soon. The second largest group at the show was the Volkswagens, and they managed to showcase a diverse range of models that highlight the brand's versatility and rich history. Amongst them, the Beatles stood out for their iconic design and cultural significance. They ranged in year from the late 1950s to the late 1960s, and these Beatles represent a journey through the decades where their distinctive shape and, well, you might call it performance, perhaps reliability or rough and ready nature, made them a household name worldwide. Equally notable, there were quite a few combis, embodying a sense of adventure, nostalgia, the hippie era if you will. The 1970s models in particular showcased the classic van design that's been beloved by generations, and with their unique charm and practicality, they've become a symbol of a bygone era of road trips and exploration. From a more modern perspective, there was a 2009 Passat R36 and a 2015 Golf R. These models reflect Volkswagen's continuous innovation and blend everyday usability with enhanced performance capabilities. The Passat, with its more executive style, and the Golf R is more of a hot hatch. And they both demonstrate Volkswagen's ability to adapt and excel in various vehicle segments. In summary, the Volkswagen group presented a fascinating mix from the classic and sentimental Beatles and Combis to the more contemporary and performance-oriented Golf. Interestingly though, for all of the Volkswagens here, there were no Audis, which I found a little bit strange, a little bit unusual. There are plenty of fast Audis kicking around the Greater Hobart area, and I really would have hoped to have seen some there. The last car I want to look at is this 1968 Volkswagen Beetle. It's really clean, it's been resprayed, and it's sitting on wider steel wheels. It's mostly period correct, though the engine bay has been painted red. So why does this stand out to me? Well, beyond being just clean, I'm pretty certain, about 90% certain, that this is my old car. I sold it to someone who said they were going to do exactly this to it, and it looks like they followed through, which is great to see. I imagine it drives a lot better now and leaks a lot less oil, which, honestly, wouldn't be too much of a challenge to improve upon. Seeing this one, though, with a fresh coat of paint and tasteful modifications, it's like meeting an old friend who's gone through a bit of a transformation. It's fascinating to think about the journey this car must have gone on since I last saw it. The work that's been put into it clearly shows a deep appreciation for the car. And the wider steel wheels, the respray, the engine upgrades, they all add a new dimension to what was already a classic design. It's moments like these that really highlight the personal connections we form with our cars. They're not just machines, they become a part of our lives and our stories. And to see a piece of my own automotive history here, lovingly restored and cruising around, is a special kind of full circle. So if you're the current owner, hats off to you, you've done an amazing job preserving the spirit of this classic Beetle while making it your own. It's a real testament to the enduring appeal and versatility of these cars. And that brings us to the end of our tour here at the Shannon's All German Car Show in Hobart. Today we've had the privilege of exploring a bunch of cars that have their own story and character. I hope that this show continues to grow and that next year, hopefully, 
we can see different strange things. I'd really like to see an NSU show up, and NSU prints in particular. That said, this has been a fantastic showcase of German engineering, and it's an incredible experience being able to walk around and see this variety of different vehicles. I was especially happy to see the Beetle. Seeing your own cars in show, it's fantastic. It's good to see how they develop and grow. I hope you enjoyed this journey as much as I did, and I hope you found a little bit of inspiration, perhaps. Let me know in the comments if any of these vehicles have wildly different prices where you live, and I'd love to hear which car was your favourite and why. As a side note, if you could press subscribe, that would be great, because we're just about to get 100 subscribers, and I'd really appreciate it. Anywho, I'll be back soon with more work on the Falcon, and hopefully, in that video, it'll be registered and fully on the road. I'll see you then. Bye.